Africa, where the human race began. Nearly a billion people live here. And it's a continent with an incredible diversity of communities and cultures. Yet we know less of its history than almost anywhere else on Earth. But that's beginning to change. In the last few decades, researchers and archaeologists have begun to uncover a range of histories as impressive and extraordinary as anywhere else on Earth. It's a history which has been neglected for years, and it's largely without written records. But it is preserved for us in the gold and statues, in the culture, art, and legends of the people. My name is Gus Casely Hayford. Over many years, I've studied the history and culture of Africa. As an art historian, I'm used to drawing stories from mute objects from the past. I'm going to discover the history and find out what really happened to the lost kingdoms of Africa. In 1871, a German geologist exploring southern Africa stumbled across these extraordinary ruins. He was astonished by what he found. A vast stone city, stranded in the empty savannah, Great Zimbabwe. He had no idea who was responsible for this astounding feat of architecture. But he was sure of one thing. It was too sophisticated to have been built by Africans. Thankfully, these assumptions have been discredited today. But only now are we piecing together the fragments we know about this lost civilization and its connections to other kingdoms of pre-colonial southern Africa. Could Great Zimbabwe really have been an African El Dorado, a city built on gold? In this film, I'm going in search of the story of one of the most mysterious cities and societies in Africa. I don't think we can understand this kingdom without understanding the civilizations and kingdoms that grew up around it. It was part of a rich and fascinating history, largely unknown, the history of wealth, trade and gold. My journey to find out about Great Zimbabwe would take me from the Swahili coast in modern-day Tanzania to Mozambique, South Africa, and hopefully to modern Zimbabwe itself, where no BBC crew has been allowed to film for eight years. My first stop is right here at the edge of the continent, where Africa meets the Indian Ocean. This is the ancient Swahili coast. For centuries, people have been drawn here from as far away as China, India, and the Middle East. And they've been drawn here by trade, trade in goods, but particularly trade in gold. For many years, Western scholars paid little attention to the history of this coast. They didn't think it fitted into the wider trade patterns of the ancient world, to Arabia in the north and India in the east. But recent research now suggests that this coast was central to an international trade in gold, gold which originated in Great Zimbabwe, 1,500 kilometers inland. And I think this ancient trade route may lead to a better understanding of what Great Zimbabwe actually represents in the untold history of this continent. There's evidence to suggest that traders were already coming to this coast from far afield as long ago as the first century AD. I've got my holiday reading with me, which is, uh, well, it's a bit more than holiday reading. This is uh, the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, which is a, a first century guide to the Indian Ocean. It talks about 
all the sorts of wonderful places that merchants and sailors could have travelled in that time to ply their trade. And it talks about this place called Raptor, which is supposed to be the most southerly port in Africa that you could then travel to. The Periplus is an ancient Greek text which describes the ports and cities which dot this coast all the way up to Arabia. According to the Periplus, Raptor was the place where traders from India and Arabia came to buy ivory, fine tortoiseshell and rhinoceros horn. In return, the people of Raptor imported spears, daggers and glass. But unfortunately, the Periplus is vague on the exact whereabouts of Raptor. And the stories of this trading city have been dismissed as legend. Now, however, Professor Felix Charmi of the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania thinks he might have found it. Are you Felix? Hey! Hi, I've heard a lot about you. I've been reading my parenthesis in preparation for this. Good man. Well, I know you're the man to show me around. You're welcome. I mean, the legendary raptor. I mean, if you found it, this is quite something, so I'm expecting a lot. Felix Charmi is a world-renowned archaeologist whose work has been instrumental in piecing together the ancient history of the Swahili coast. If he has indeed found Raptor, this will rank as his greatest discovery yet. It will also prove that this region was a vibrant part of the ancient world. Did you see a crocodile? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's a lizard, isn't it? Monitor yeah, lizard. It's just amazing. <laughs> Felix and I are on the Rafiji River, which flows to the Indian Ocean from deep within the African interior. You managed to do it and not get any mud on your shoes. Yeah. That side was bad, I told you. Felix believes that Raptor once stood near the banks of this river. But Felix's idea of near is a little different from mine. It's also dangerous. You can see there are snakes here. There are snakes. And when you're you a fan of snakes, Felix. The kind of snakes? All sorts. Pythons. Pythons? Pythons, yes. The Periplus talks of Raptor as a great trading center a cosmopolitan metropolis where traders from all over the ancient world would meet and barter and try to make a quick buck. But it's difficult to imagine such a vibrant place existing here, in this riverside wilderness, with crocodiles and snakes. I'm beginning to wonder if the charming Felix Charmi has made a mistake. Then, one hour later, in the dirt beneath our feet, fragments of an ancient world emerge. This is the beginning of what I call a uh, raptor site. And actually, if you look down, there are pottery of 2,000 years. Probably has been brought down from the settlement. And uh, if you again you move and see the ground, yes. as you can see, for example, you can see this one. This is a piece of pottery. For sure, it is 2,000 years old. Once you get your eye in, they're everywhere, aren't <laughs> yeah, they? Yeah, and, and actually, if you are able to clean this ground, you'll see more. You can see like, there's another piece there. Yes. And when we go up, I'll, see you, I'll show you more. Buried beneath the dirt and foliage of this isolated wilderness, Felix thinks he's found something remarkable. Shards of pottery, tantalizing evidence of an ancient settlement. So somewhere under here yeah. may well be the, the remains of, of, of Raptor. Exactly. Felix thinks he's found Raptor because of the age and variety of the pottery which lies hidden beneath the surface. Yeah, I promise you that I'll show you some pot sheds. They are 2,000 years 2000 old. 2,000 years Actually, old. Actually, carbon 14 dating for this material is giving us a date of 200 to about 300 hmm. AD. 280 is a common date here for this kind of pottery. Are these imported or are they made? No, they are local. They're, made, they're local? They are local, yes. Have you found pottery that has come from beyond these shores, beyond...? Yes, yes, we have found good amount of uh, ceramics, 
which are brought from different parts of the world. This pottery from Egypt was uh, examined by a professor in Sweden, and he confirmed this pottery is from the Nile Valley. You can see the, 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 the texture of it. It's incredibly fine and light, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, exactly. You can even see the color of it, the pinkish color of yes. it. Yes. No? It feels like we're in the middle of nowhere, but the evidence from the pottery, its age, its varied provenance, and the sheer amount of shards suggests that Felix might be right. That in this empty place, a trading center once thrived, playing host to merchants from as far afield as ancient Egypt and India. Evidence that, from the earliest of times, this part of Africa had established trade routes with the wider world. Talking to Felix, I mean, he's opened up a whole raft of possibilities of where to explore next, but more than anything, it's this idea that this was the hub of a whole network of ports that ran down this bit of the coast. According to the Periplus, Raptor traded in goods from the African interior, like ivory and rhinoceros horn. But there's no sign yet of the trade in gold which I'm looking for. But as I head back into town the next morning, toward the markets that bustle here today, I can hear the evidence of a legacy of trade, exchange, and contact with a world beyond this coast in the language that people speak. Swahili is an African language, but one which has incorporated many words from around the world, like a linguistic melting pot. The word Swahili itself actually comes from the Arabic word for coast, and there are traces of Indian and even Portuguese too. In fact, Portuguese traders first passed through here in 1498 and described a spectacularly wealthy city on an island just off the coast. And that's where I'm headed next. The Portuguese produced these absolutely beautiful maps and illustrations of this gorgeous place. And they just look so deeply impressive. And if the place lives up to this, it's just going to be magnificent. The city was Kilwa Kisiwani, a city whose streets the Portuguese describe as overflowing with gold and filled with black moors, the old European term for Africans. Colonial historians assume that Kilwa was an Arab outpost because of its Muslim heritage. But now we think that Kilwa was African, that these were black African Muslims, an interpretation backed up by the observations of the famous Arab traveler Ibn Battuta who came to Kilwa in 1331. He talks about Kilwa as one of the most beautiful cities. And he talks about the local population as being a very dark complexion. And he describes their ethnic scarifications. I mean, this really was an African city, and it was also a very profitable one. The reason I'm here is that a copper coin like this from 14th century Kilwa has been found at Great Zimbabwe, 1,500 kilometers inland. Evidence, perhaps, that Great Zimbabwe and Kilwa are two ends of what was a lucrative trade in goods. Those early Portuguese travelers described a city of fine coral-built houses and the ruler's hundred-room palace full of gold, silver and precious stones. The site is still spectacular today. Among the ruins are the houses which would have accommodated the traveling foreign traders who regularly descended on Kilwa from across the ocean. Local guide, Athmani Abdullah has agreed to show me around. 
So why particularly Kilwa? Why was it such an important post in, in terms of the trading network along the coast? Yeah, it was important because uh, it was easier for the traders who used the, the sailing boats to come here. So it acts like a barrier because when you come in, you can anchor easily because these guys were traveling through the monsoon wind. The direction of the prevailing wind on the Swahili coast changes twice a year, allowing ships to cross the Indian Ocean and return again within 12 months. And that's why Kilwa was ideally placed to serve as East Africa's gateway to the trading networks of the ancient world. Lovely to meet Hi. you, Stephanie. Nice Hi. to meet you. Welcome to Kilwa. Oh, thank you. <laughs> British archaeologist Stephanie Wynne-Jones of Bristol University is an expert on Kilwa's history and has studied how its fortunes have ebbed and flowed through the ages. One of the things that's really been demonstrated through the archaeology is that there's been a settlement here since the, at least the 9th century AD. They were really integrated into the Indian Ocean system, actually, and there are a lot of imports brought to the site from um, mainly from the Persian Gulf area, also from India, um, as sort of reaching this island at, at that date. So what was being traded through this port, exported? What sorts of goods were... Well, in general, from the Swahili coast, um, the products of the African hinterland were being traded, often in the form of raw materials. Kilwa was particularly famous for gold, and the source of Kilwa's wealth was um, based on the gold trade from the south from the Zimbabwe plateau. This was an island state made rich by gold. These merchants knew the international value of the precious metal and bargained hard. And as the gold flowed through Kilwa, by the 14th century, the city had become one of the most important and richest ports in Africa. And if you look closely enough, some of that wealth is still visible. Well, this is the great mosque of Kilwa, the Congregational Mosque, which would have uh, served for the Friday prayer when the whole community would come together. And one of the things that's quite wonderful about this particular structure um, are the domes and vaults that you can see uh, in the roof. Um, and this is a very particularly Kilwa phenomenon to, um, to have this sort of quantity of, of domes and the, all those sort of arches and columns that you see here. And finding this incredible material, I mean, is it, this is coral, isn't it? It is, and uh, I mean, this is one of the, this is the defining characteristic of Swahili architecture. Um, we call these places stone towns and we refer to stone houses, but actually there's no natural, particularly good natural sources of stone on the coast. Um, and instead, this architectural style developed where they use the coral, which is found in abundance here, um, and the the entire structures are built of coral. The blocks, like the one that you're looking at, um, were actually cut from the living coral, and because it was soft, they were able to use it for these carved features. And then, how would it have been finished? So, what would it have looked like if I came in? Well. Well, the entire thing would have been plastered also with lime plaster, um, which actually also comes from coral. So everything is from coral from start to finish. And it would have appeared, you know, totally smooth and totally white. Mm. And it would have been a very beautiful thing to look at, actually. Beautiful and technically sophisticated. Many of the great buildings of Europe were built around the same time. The Piazza del Campo in Siena, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. To my mind, this is surely a match for them. Kilwa was clearly a busy, confident trading center, a city-state that was intimately linked with the wider world economy. But if Kilwa's wealth came from the gold it traded across this vast ocean, the source of this wealth, the precious commodity which formed the basis of this trade, is not found in Kilwa. Africa's gold comes from deep inland, from the high plateau of Zimbabwe, 1,500 kilometers away. And now I'm going to try and trace this gold route to its source. 
I'm traveling inland from the post, heading west toward the ancient gold lands. And somewhere out here, I'm hoping to find an outpost of one of Africa's greatest kingdoms. We know that Great Zimbabwe was at its zenith in the 13th and 14th centuries, just when Kilwa II was at its height. But Great Zimbabwe is still two countries, one visa application and many days travel away. I'm looking for outposts of this gold trading kingdom here in Mozambique. Tantalizingly, my guide tells me that there's a Zimbabwe-type ruin just 70 kilometers inland from here. This site, Manikeni, is mentioned in the history books, but I can't find it on any map. Por favor, onde é esta Manikeni? Manikeni é daqui a 32 km. Of these sandy roads are a bit of a challenge, actually, but uh, I'm a bit more used to um, to active in rush hour than this, but. Uh, I'm loving it, nevertheless. There's a welcome waiting for me, led by local historian Vicente Villanculos. Hello, oh, welcome hello. to Manikeni. And the villagers want to perform a small good luck ceremony for us. We have visitors here that want all things to go well, so that no snakes, no anyone can be beaten or something go wrong. Thank you. Yeah. I particularly hate snakes, so I think that's <laughs> really great to do. Okay. Thank you. The chief's son offers beer to the ancestors on our behalf. <laughs> the ancestors have heard us and have welcomed us. Thank you very much. Thank you, chief. With the blessings of his forebears, Vicente and I set off for the ruins of Manikeni. And what was its relationship to the coast and also to Great Zimbabwe? Actually, Manikeni was in between the coast and the Great Zimbabwe. People from the coast used to bring like things to trade here, and this was a trading place. Actually, Manikeni means it's a burnt way that means the place where people can give to each other. Really? Yes. I see. That's what is the meaning of Manikeni. The existence of Manikeni was barely known to scholars until the 1970s. But when archaeologists did come to dig it up, they were rewarded with some clues about its past. They found things like gold, things like copper wires, things like uh, uh, blades, things like glass beads. But this is a lost history in more ways than one. The museum which housed most of Manikeni's treasures was destroyed by fire. But while the artifacts have gone, the knowledge remains. We know that gold was found in the graves of Manikeni's elders and that there are some startling links to Great Zimbabwe. This grass here is a typically from Great Zimbabwe. In Mozambique, it can be found just in this place. Yes. So this grass, this particular variety of grass, yes, this one. is only found in Manikeni, in Manikeni. and Great Zimbabwe. So right. they brought this grass to feed their cattle? We don't find this kind of grass anywhere in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. So we believe that it was brought here mainly to feed the cattle. Great Zimbabwe means houses of stone. The walls of Manikeni appear to have been built using a similar technique. Vicente is certain that the trading community at Manikeni was once closely connected to the kingdom of Great Zimbabwe. So this is the walls, the walls of Manikeni. They were built stone on the stone and it stood for many years and very strongly. And after doing business, people from the coast and people from Grand Zimbabwe, whatever they exchanged, like gold and beads and all the things, they used to take this way to lead them to Grand Zimbabwe. Wow. So, so this, is, this is the gateway this is the to gateway. Great Zimbabwe? Yes. 
Manikeni seems to have been a crossing point in two senses. It seems likely that it was a place where gold was traded as a commodity, coming in from Great Zimbabwe, then going out toward the coast and by boat up to Kilwa. But it also seems to be a place where the attitude to the gold itself shifted. Grave findings at Manikeni show that gold was not just a commodity, it was buried with the dead, very different from Kilwa. It's time to move further inland, but first a send-off from the ancestors. Manikeni today is far from the bustling trading centre of the past, but it's a place where the past is remembered and where the ancestors who may once have formed an important cog in a larger global economy are celebrated enthusiastically. This is a sort of passing on to the future generation because the old ones, they will be dying out, so they want their children to know how to dance. That's why they have to dance with the young ones. It seems a little bit easy, but it's not easy. <laughs> it is believed the ancestors are dancing right now. Yes. Yes, and they're hearing it. So they're happy that they have not been forgotten. Yes. The evidence that this place was once a link in the gold trade between Great Zimbabwe and the coast seems compelling. The architecture, the grass, the oral tradition and the discoveries of gold all point that way. But before I head for Great Zimbabwe, I want to investigate stories of an even earlier kingdom, Mapungubwe. But to do that, I need to head for the modern city of Pretoria in South Africa. Mapungubwe is now part of South Africa's Limpopo province, and fate has been kinder to it than it has been to Manikeni. The museum where Mapungubwe's glorious past is now stored is still standing, home to an astonishing collection of African gold. Curator Cyan Tiley Nell shows me the most famous piece, a little golden rhino. Wow. Gold is so thin; it almost glows, doesn't it? It's yes, yes. The gold, the gold would have been hammered out on a stone anvil. What they would have done is they would have carved a wooden rhino and then formed the gold foil over the wood. And all the little holes you see are where minute tacks or nails would tack uh, the gold sheeting to the wood, the wooden core. And of course, the wood is disintegrated over a thousand years. Almost 100% pure gold, so it's got a lovely buttery shine to it. So they must have been a very powerful people. Yes, they were. Um, in fact, there's many other gold artifacts that were found. The second, perhaps most significant item is this gold scepter or mace. It's the largest gold object that was recovered from, from the burial, also made of, of gold foil. Mapungubwe was a 12th century kingdom, only a short distance from the gold mines of the Zimbabwean plateau. Its people clearly developed great skill in goldsmithing. This work is impressive by anyone's standards. As at Manikeni, much of the treasure was found in the graves of the kings. And such burials imply a culture which valued gold for more than its commercial value. Gosh, this is a beautiful bowl, isn't it? Absolutely gorgeous. In fact, it's not a gold bowl. It's in fact a headdress. Oh, okay. uh, it was also found in one of the burials. Um, for 75 years, it's been interpreted as a bowl as such because it obviously just looks like a bowl. So I'm in good company. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in fact, it was it was found inverted near the cranium of the individual um, near his head, not as a crown, as if it would fit over the cranium. Of course, it's it's too small, but more a symbolic headdress of some sort. So, Cyan, who might have been buried with this? Well, the royalty buried with these gold objects. Um, of course were the ruling power of the Limpopo Valley at the time, or, or Southern Africa. Yeah. So their wealth lay in, in not only the gold objects, but also their wealth in cattle and trading right until the east coast. The amount of glass, trade glass beads that one finds at the site together with the gold, as well as the ivory, shows a, a very wealthy society. Time to visit Mapungubwe for myself. Nice to meet you. And for that, I need to get airborne. Local farmer Jacques Villemse has offered to give me a ride. From 
From up here, things become a bit clearer. Below me is the mighty Limpopo, which flows to the coast. This huge river was for centuries a highway which carried people and goods from the interior to the coast. what remains of the Golden Kingdom of Mapungubwe. Today, Mapungubwe is part of South Africa's national park system. The heart of the Old Kingdom is Mapungubwe Hill. Park ranger Cedric Setlako has agreed to show me around. This is uh, the hill itself, Mapungubwe Hill where people lived about a, a thousand years ago. Wow. Archaeologists believe that Mapungubwe's reach spread across southern Africa from the 11th to the 13th centuries, and that after the kingdom collapsed, some of its people may have headed north and founded Great Zimbabwe. It was one of the most complex societies in southern Africa, with a rigid division between the king, his ministers, and his subjects. The the king was buried here with a lot of artifacts. Uh, if you look at the hill itself, I mean, why the people would choose to live up here is because um, if you look around it, I mean, it's just sheer rock. I mean, there's no way that you can be able to can access this hill. There's only one way up to the top. The kingdom's rulers kept the hill to themselves. Ordinary members of Mapungubwe's society were not allowed in. Even in modern times, the hill still holds mystical powers to the people here. Most of the people long back used to believe that you wouldn't even look at the hill itself. Really? They were even scared to look at the hill. I mean, even the person who brought the first people uh, to discover the site, I mean, he had to turn his back and sort of like point at, there is the hill right behind me, and I'm not going there. Really? Yeah. So, so what might happen to you if you did look at the hill? What, what I mean, um, some people believe that you would, you would go blind or lose your life or die or something like that. Oh. It wasn't so bad, eh? <laughs> well, this view completely makes up for... Yeah. Any tiredness I feel about that climb, it's just glorious. Well, I mean, and suddenly you understand why you would want to build up here. Archaeologists have found remnants of the site of a grand stone enclosure here, with huts for servants and a wooden palisade built around the summit for privacy and defence. It was also where Mapungubwe's rulers lived and died with their gold. This is exactly where uh, that uh, little golden rhino camp. Just from around here, it's exactly where it was discovered. And also to indicate to you that from, from the bush back there up to here, this whole area, this was a burial site. These people were buried in a sitting position facing west, and each one of them was buried wearing these golden bracelets, and the was well buried with clay pots, which were filled with thousands and thousands of golden glass beads. So Cedric, why was this site so important? Mapungubwe is the first Southern African kingdom, meaning this is exactly where kingdomship started in Southern Africa. I mean, of all these uh, kingdoms which are still in existence even today, I mean, this is exactly where it all started. The wooden and stone structures which would have stood here have long since disappeared. But the gold artifacts in Pretoria testify to this ancient kingdom's existence, its power and its wealth. But Cedric is keen to show me one aspect of Mapungubwe life that still survives today. Now we have a uh, game here. It was played by the Mapungubwe people a thousand years ago. This is a game called Muruba in Sutu, Mufuba in Venda. I think I recognize this. 
But please, tell me. Do you? Um, well, my family from West Africa, and we have a, a game there which looks fairly similar called Awari. Awari is an ancient game of strategy. Now, you see, the gloves are off. The gloves are off. <laughs> I always thought that Awari was a West African tradition. But the fact that variations of it were played here in Mapungubwe hints at connections which extend across the continent. So maybe this wasn't an isolated kingdom. Maybe it was connected with cultures across the continent. The outline of Mapungubwe society may be faint today, but the kingdom's geography seems clear. The subjects and their families lived at the bottom of the hill, and at the top, protected by the forbidding stone enclosures, were the royal family and their retinue. I think one of the things that has really struck me is how complex the sociology of this particular area is. I mean, if you imagine the people came and they settled here, but they didn't just settle here, but they created a really complex social system. The support of all the people who would have lived down here, farming, trading, bringing the water up, all of that infrastructure to support the family, the elite that lived up there. And this was a real departure for this bit of Africa, a settled hierarchical society, and one that seemed to, at least for the period in which it was here, to really work as well. Mapungubwe was once the most powerful kingdom in southern Africa. But by the 13th century, it seems to have collapsed. We don't know why. And there is much more we don't know about the life of the people here, like how power was handed down or what they believed in. But archaeologists now think that the people of Mapungubwe may have traveled north to found an even bigger, more impressive kingdom, Great Zimbabwe. Good news, we've finally been granted permission to film in Great Zimbabwe, the greatest lost kingdom of Southern Africa. I'm not gonna pretend it's been easy getting permission to film in Zimbabwe. It's taken months of applications, persuasion, and at last it looks like we've got permission. But nothing is certain in Zimbabwe these days. Even with our permissions, there's still a border to cross. It took four hours, but eventually, I'm in. A 16th century Portuguese captain described Great Zimbabwe as an almost mythical city. Among the gold mines of the inland plains is a fortress built of stones of marvelous size, and there appears to be no mortar joining them. Great Zimbabwe was Africa's El Dorado, a place of myth and mystery. I'm meeting Zimbabwean archaeologist Edward Mitenga, former curator of the entire site. Edward. Hello. 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 It's Gus. Hello. Lovely to meet you. He tells me the ruins are so important to the people here that I must have the blessing of one of the site's spiritual guardians, Ambua Vazarira, before I can get in. Gus. What I'm saying is that you are welcome to Great Zimbabwe is, in a, um, is an honourable guest. So uh, now we are going to take you to the sacred entrance to, to the site. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. It's been a beautiful welcome. As well as curating this site, Edwin Matenga has written extensively about Great Zimbabwe. He is recognised as one of the world's foremost authorities on this mysterious place. For, say, 1890, yeah. this place was out of bounds to, really? to, to, to strangers. Yes. Uh, you are not a stranger anymore because you, you, have, you have now been accepted. Well, I feel very honoured. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, basically, people would 
would, 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 would help the, to be initiated as it were. And part of the initiation is passing through the, 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 the entrance. I see. Where uh, the, the, the custodian, the, 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 the spiritual sort of uh, the head of the, the place yes. opens the site for, for I people coming. I see. So she is the, she is the key to the she, site? She, yes, she is the key. In her sort of responsibility, she has to open the entrance. The entrance. Yeah, so she traditionally, is. you'd have to stop here. You have to stop here. Bambua is one of several people who claim to be the spiritual guardians of this site. It certainly is an impressive performance. She's saying that uh, now you can you can you can, can enter the site. Can enter the site. Yeah. Okay. This is the great gold kingdom of great Zimbabwe. For 200 years, the rulers of this place controlled a massive empire between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers, covering much of modern day Zimbabwe and part of Mozambique. This was their capital, their palace and their bastion. This is the cradle of a lot of people who live in this region. The descendants of people who used to live here are now found in South Africa, in Botswana, yes. in, other, in other countries. From the 13th century to the 15th, these people controlled the gold mines of the plateau. Here in stone is their expression of that wealth and power. Walls that soar out of the earth, that curve and flow around the contours of the ground, creating narrow passageways and forbidding enclosures. This is a stunning feat of architecture. There is nothing gluing these walls together, just an extraordinary precision and craft. This is the highest wall at the Great Zimbabwe at 11, 11 meters. It is six meters wide at the bottom. Um, it is uh, estimated that uh, about more than a million uh, uh, bricks are pegged into this uh, into this wall. At its height, this place was a medieval city, home to 25,000 people, seemingly divided into social groups. Right now we are on the summit of the, uh, the, 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 the Zimbabwe Hill. Mm. This is called the Zimbabwe Hill Complex. There are three sort of uh, uh, areas of the making up this, the site. We were the hill complex, we were the, the valley ruins of which the, the largest building, uh, the Great Enclosure, is located mm. uh, 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 there. And then uh, beyond the, 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 uh, the, 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 the stone walls, and least obvious, of course, to many visitors, is the fact that there were a lot of housing units, dense housing units that were located outside the enclosures and over an area uh, of about 720 hectares. The subjects and their king seem to have lived very separate lives. It's likely that Great Zimbabwe's immense stone walls ensured that the rich, religious, and the powerful were kept separate from everyone else. Yes, uh, the site, in many ways, is a matrix of passages. Yes. And the way they build so many passages is uh, anybody's guess. But I want to believe that it might have something to do with uh, uh, social protocols. Yes. But, uh, 
the idea basically was to control the traffic of people. Oh, I see. Some people were not uh, uh, supposed to be seen, seen in certain places. Yes. So they would have to follow designated uh, passages. So there might have been various passages for sort of various levels of, I mean, in terms of social organization of the community. Yes. That, okay, the kings or the royal wives, they would follow these passages. And then, of course, the plebeians, the, the, the lower sort of rank, would follow these passages. But for decades, the significance of this place, what it meant, who built it, has been fiercely debated. The British, who ran this part of the world in the late 19th century, believed that a non-African people must have built this kingdom. Speculation as to who that might have been has ranged from the Phoenicians to the Queen of Sheba. When this country was run by its white minority, the idea that anyone but Africans built this city was actively and enthusiastically promoted. But carbon dating technology has ruled out ancient foreign civilizations as being responsible for Great Zimbabwe. There's no evidence in this architecture to suggest that this place was built by anyone other than those who came from here. And the evidence from earlier settlements, like Mapungubwe, shows a continuity of Southern African culture the settled view now is, Great Zimbabwe was built by Africans. Archaeologists are also sure that this place was a rich trading kingdom. A wealth of trading goods, beads, bracelets, porcelain and glass from China and the Middle East have been found here. Along with gold, mined only 40 kilometers away. Gold was obviously very important and we know there was traffic between uh, uh, this place or the southern African hinterland in the East African coast linking with uh, China, with India, mm -hmm. uh, with the Middle East. Yes. Uh, and that was one factor that might have uh, uh, caused uh, people to become wealth mm. and build these structures mm. as an expression of that wealth. Mm. One artifact in particular shows the links between Great Zimbabwe and the wider world. It's a 14th century copper coin like this one from Kilwa Kisiwani, the great trading city on the coast. A place which derived its wealth by selling on the gold from Great Zimbabwe to the rest of the world. Two ends, the same trading route. There's still so much that we don't know about Great Zimbabwe, the nature of its king or kings, the full meaning of its narrow passageways, and forbidding architecture. But we do know that this vast city was one of Africa's richest and most sophisticated kingdoms, and the starting point of a gigantic trading network that stretched from these high plateau across southern Africa to the Swahili coast and across the globe to Arabia, India and China. And when Great Zimbabwe went into decline in the 15th century, so too did Kilwa, two kingdoms connected by gold and forgotten by historians for centuries. Today, the ruins of Great Zimbabwe have given their name to a modern African country. They are a reminder that although ancient kingdoms can be forgotten, they are rarely truly lost. This remarkable kingdom, high in the Zimbabwe highlands, is an emblem of a continent remembering its past. I began this journey some distance from here on the Swahili coast, thinking that this was a journey about trade, about gold. But it's been about more than that. It's been about recovering an African past from the ruins of lost civilizations. There's still much we don't know about this history and these lost kingdoms. But here in Africa, their memory is still celebrated, and rightly so. The past is still very much alive here. It's still a living, breathing part of people's lives, their culture, and their identity.
Coming up tonight here on BBC4, we're staying in Africa as we explore the world in 80 treasures. The Ark of the Covenant from Ethiopia is up next.